God, I love this church. I do. I just love these people, you know? They're, they just, they'll do anything. It's wonderful. Uh, so, um, okay, so here we are, the last installment. Dorothy wants to return home. Now, I think um, this has less to do with uh, the Depression-era black and white dust bowl of Kansas at that time and the meager living that she might eventually eke out uh, as a farmer's wife. Uh, I think it has less to do with that than returning home to save her Auntie M, who she believes is heartbroken because of her disappearance. Now, every step along the yellow brick road is uh, paved with Dorothy's inner strength, her spirit of love, and her compassion for others. These are things that exist within her that she finds uh, and uses on her, on her journey. So like Dorothy, I think we're all called to leave um, whatever wasteland we might have experienced to step into a, a greater life, a bigger, better life. You know, that um, it's interesting that it starts with Dorothy dreaming of leaving, and it and then very quickly turns to Dorothy dreaming of returning to where she came from. So today my topic is safe and sound. And you know, one of the things I like about fairy tales is how they activate our imagination at lots of different levels, that they can uh, bring us in touch with something, uh, with a deep theme that, that's already within us. So, so I've talked about uh, unfamiliar territory, where Dorothy, as, as a character within each of us, makes this journey and she ultimately wants to return home. So we think we can be separate from God. So that's the deal here on unfamiliar territory, that we think we can be separate from God. In truth, of course, we could not possibly be separate from God, but we do have these extraordinary imaginations. You know, and our longing can be satisfied, but not necessarily according to our picture. See, Dorothy, young Dorothy, she gets a wake-up call from life. She wants something other than what she has. She wants to be someplace other than where she is. You know, she wants to outrun her karma, really. You know, she wants to keep doing what isn't working, right? So the external needs to change is her kind of thinking. If things out here would change in the world I live in, if people would behave differently, if people would treat me differently, if circumstances were different, then I could be really, really happy. Who among us has ever said that? So if I keep saying, um, saying outside of me is the problem, I can't be fulfilled. You understand? If we say the problem is outside of us, then we're not being at cause in our own existence. So then the second week I talked about, so you made an enemy. And she affirms and visualizes a better, happier place over the rainbow, and, uh, and her house lands on top of the Wicked Witch of the East. Now, she was uh, not really teachable where she was in Kansas, and later, in front of the wizard, she will be teachable. I talked about everybody and nobody is perfect, that we are all both human and divine. And in our teaching, we believe in spiritual perfection, but the human is catching up to it, right? Uh, the spiritually perfect, yes, you know, uh, in Hinduism, they talk about the ball of fire that burns in our heart. We would say that's the perfection. That's the God essence within each of us, you know? But humanly, we understand that we are all a work in progress. And so difficult people who show up in our life force us to grow the most, you know, and the mantra that Dorothy is using is to follow the yellow brick road. So I asked you to identify your mantra. What is that thing that you say to yourself most often? And you might find that it's life-affirming or life-negating, that it empowers you or disempowers you, but everybody seems to have a mantra, something that they say to themselves all day long. It's almost like it becomes your personal law in life. Now, Dorothy's real enemy is the temptation to go unconscious in the midst of her own life, just like we do. Everybody goes unconscious at some point. Now, we believe, and I think this is really illustrated very well in the story, that everyone is a reflection of our consciousness, that everybody who shows up in our life is a reflection of our consciousness. Now, in Dorothy's case, the people who show up in her life are reflecting back to her this universal doubt, this belief that I'm not enough or there's not enough. So the scarecrow is not smart enough, the tin man is not lovable enough, and the lion doesn't have what it takes or the courage to face his own life. So remember, Dorothy does ultimately want to be elsewhere. And they all think the wizard can make it all better. You know, um, 
there was a line uh, from a Stephen Sondheim that I, that I really like, and he says that everyone wants a witch to blame. So, you know, the problem with that is as long as you're blaming, you're still in victim consciousness. As long as you're blaming, somebody outside of you has the power. As long as you're blaming, you're in the past. So the witch is just, you know, we could say uh, the shadow side of ourself, just showing us what we have suppressed up until now. So Dorothy does, of course, make it home. I mean, and the truth is, though, what we want to remember as students of the science of mind is that we are, in fact, home right now in the heart of God. Wherever we are, whatever our circumstances, we are always at home because we cannot be separate from the heart of God. Now, this is not a test. You know? It is a real life. Yes, we are in a real life right here, right now. Had this been a test, you would have been notified by the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> But this is not a test. This is a real life. You know? Now, we've also talked about how crises seem to get our attention. And there's that wonderful line in A Course in Miracles that says, we can learn through joy or we can learn through pain. And wouldn't it be great to do our learning from here on out through joy? Because don't you feel like you've learned enough of the painful lessons? Don't you feel like, you know, look, if, if God and the universe wanted to teach me through joy, I swear my eyes are wide open. I would get it. I would get it through joy rather than having to learn the things I need to learn through pain. And people always say, well, why does God let that happen? And it's like, well, because we have free will and we have choice. And when the universe knocks gently, we often do not answer. So then we get hit with a cosmic two by four and we say, oh my God, how did this happen to me? How did I get here? Well, you wouldn't learn through joy, so the universe sends a little bit of pain and that seems to be the wake up. You know, in the Gospel of Thomas, it says, um, if the kingdom of heaven is in the sky, then the birds of the air will get there before I do. Um, and, if, if, and, if, and if there are a lot of birds there, um, well, I don't know. Have you ever been around a lot of birds? I think they're messy. I don't, really, don't want to be where there are a lot of birds, you know. Um, that's why I never go to Reverend Mark's house. He's got a, no, I'm just kidding. It's a, uh, that, uh, that, you know, we teach that heaven is not a place, but heaven is a state of consciousness. It's an awareness of our oneness. So Dorothy's journey, our journey, is about a movement in consciousness. Dorothy's journey and our journey is about always deepening spiritually. So where do I need to go deeper in my consciousness? And that's what I'd like you to ask yourself today. You know, and what's the quality of spirit I bring to, to my life right now. Like, think about it. What's the quality of spirit you bring to your relationships? Your loving relationships, your interpersonal relationships, your friendships, your work relationships? What's the quality of spirit you bring to your work, whatever work you do in the world? What's the quality of spirit you bring to your creative expression? See, I think there's so many different things that we could learn from the story. Like any great, great myth, you know, you look at the story once, twice, three times, and every time you see something different, one of the things I get this time is that it's really good to keep your eye on the goal because you will get distracted because life is in session. Things will come up that will seem to want to take us off the path. So it's, it's good to make friends on the journey, right? It's good to have support of like-minded people. It's good to be in the two or more because really, like we teach, only deep healing only happens in the two or more. You know, the, and I think there's something about, well, there's like, like we just saw, there's something about good shoes that's probably kind of important here. Uh, and, and the wicked witch of the West will actually kill for shoes. Does she not know that there is designer shoe warehouse? Does she, does she not know about that, you know? Because when she says, you know, because all she says, you know, she, she would kill Dorothy for those shoes, she means it. So, so the mistake, though, is that they are not her good. See, she's doing that thing that so many of us have done where she looks at somebody else and says, they have what I want. I want what they have. The only way I'm going to get it is to take it from them. This is why so many people are in prison today. They don't know that they can create their own good. So they think the only way to get it is to take it from someone else. But you have to understand that our good is ordained for us by God. No one can take it from us. People have what they have by right of consciousness. So the witch thinks to get her good, she has to take it from Dorothy. She doesn't know she can create it for herself. You know, this, and so I want Dorothy to say to the witch, hey, back off, you know? These are my shoes, go get your own, All right? Because envy and resentment of another's good will never bless us. In fact, what it will actually do is it will keep our greater good from us. 
Mm -hmm. So coveting another's good is a huge waste of time. So I think the idea is we let it inspire us. You know, when you see somebody who's living the life that you want, you say, that's for me. All right, God, that's for me. That's where I'm headed. I accept that. I accept that level of good. And then you go about creating your own. So the question to ask ourselves is, how do I create that consciousness within me? All right, that consciousness where that good is just the natural result the natural consequence of this newer, greater consciousness that I'm seeking to embody. You know, why doesn't the witch go to the wizard herself to get shoes? Do you ever wonder about that? You know, I mean, she knows he's powerful. She knows he makes stuff happen. You know, what? I wonder in our life where we covet. Think about this. Where do we covet? Where do we still think I'm not enough? See, like the scarecrow, I ask myself, am I doing what I came here to do? And this is something I think we could all ask. Are we doing what we came here to do? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes eh, partially, sometimes not so much. So in the end, I think the witch has to, um, excuse me, in the end, the wizard has to disappoint Dorothy. Because the universe busts us on the belief that someone else is the source of our good. And I bet we've all experienced that time and again when we think, oh, this out here, outside of me, this person, this situation, this thing is going to make it all, all okay. What if surrender Dorothy? You know when the witch writes that in the sky, surrender Dorothy? What if that's not give up, but go deeper? Right? This thing, we'll just look at it through a metaphysical lens. What if surrender Dorothy is not about quit because I'm more powerful than you, so just give up? What if it's actually an encouragement to go deeper, that the way to handle the situation that is so perplexing to us is that we have to go deeper within ourselves. Because when we allow something outside of us to control us, that actually limits what God is able to do through us. So you know, through right action, ultimately Dorothy's obstacle is resolved. So you ask yourself in this moment, what's the loving thing to do? Ask yourself in this moment, what's the conscious thing to do? What's the compassionate thing to do? What's the God-centered thing to do? You know, the witch, the witch ultimately is dissolved. She says, I'm melting. You know how she says it. Say it. I'm no, no, no. You know how you really want to say it. Go ahead. Do it one more time. I'm That's it. That's it. These are my people. All right. And she goes on and she says, who would have thought that a good little girl like you could destroy my wickedness? So there's a principle here. And that principle, of course, is that love conquers hate, right? No matter how long the hate has been, that love ultimately conquers hate. And so, you know, the guards rush in. Yeah, that's them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and, but see, now Dorothy's, Dorothy's love and compassion for the scarecrow whose arm has now been lit on fire by the wicked witch, causes her to throw a bucket of water on the scarecrow, but it also hits the witch and puts out the fire, and accidentally the witch melts. Okay, So again, here we are, great spiritual themes. The light is greater than the darkness. You know, and so she gets to have the witch's broomstick, and now, you know, speed ahead, speed ahead, Glinda comes in in a giant pink bubble, this is going to be what it's like when we have cars that drive themselves. Yes, it is. You know, we'll all be floating over LA in a pink bubble, you know. You know you, and, and she tells Dorothy, you've always had the power. And the scarecrow says, why didn't you tell her before? Now, this is really important because she says, she wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn it for herself. And we do this again and again. How many times have we not learned from our own experience, or from people we love and we cherish their opinion, we think, nah, now nah, I gotta do it my way anyway. But see, Dorothy has learned. Ultimately, this young girl has grown in consciousness. And when we get the wisdom, our soul has it forever, which is just a wonderful thing that we don't have to do it again when you get the wisdom. And so people often say to me, why am I doing this situation again? I thought I'd already learned this lesson. It's like, mm, apparently, you didn't get the wisdom from it. See, because we are destined to repeat things unless we are able to extract the wisdom from the situation. So Glinda asks her what she's learned, right? And it was, you know, she says it wasn't enough. Dorothy says it wasn't enough to miss Annie M and Uncle Henry. See, just wanting doesn't do it. We've all done that. We've all done lots of wanting, but wanting doesn't, it's not creative. 
You know, it doesn't make anything happen in the universe. And she said, Dorothy goes on and she says, if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it's not there, I never really lost it to, the, to begin with. And then she looks at her and says, is that right? And Glinda says, that's all it is. Hmm. So I think that's all it is. This, this actually reveals the secret of she, she reveals the secret of the ruby slippers and says, okay, just close your eyes, click your heels three times, and say there's no place like home. So that's pretty simple. Now, the thing is that Dorothy has had the power all along, right? and she didn't believe it about herself. She kept thinking the power is out there. The wizard has the power. The witch has the power. Those flying monkeys, they had the power. I know the flying monkeys, they had the power. So she has been on an adventure. She's been initiated. You know, and she's returned differently. See, on that adventure, she really discovers and uses these qualities within her, her own intelligence, her own compassion, her own love and kindness. So you know, uh, at an earlier time in the movie, when she runs into Professor Marvel, the fortune teller, he says to her, he says, close your eyes to be better in tune with the infinite. Let's do that now. So we turn our attention inward to pray for a moment, recognizing that right here where we are, the infinite absolutely is. That we are surrounded and filled with God's spirit, God's presence, God's light, and God's love. I know that that very spirit of God within us is the most true, most real thing about each and every one of us. And we have within us right now everything we need to navigate the circumstances of our life. And so I know that love is a better way to be and that there is an infinite resource of compassion and understanding and intelligence within each and every one of us that rises up and reveals to us exactly what we need to know and do. So we include in our prayer today our family members, our friends and loved ones. We know that right where they are, the fullness, the allness of God's spirit is present right there. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world. So this big world that we live in, that has so much seeming discord, we let our prayer be a light and an energy of love that emanates out from us, from our church, from our sanctuary, out into the world, touching all people in all circumstances in a positive, affirming way. We bless our church. We bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we're blessed by being together today, that everybody gets to be healed. And so with a full heart, I say, thank you, God, that this is the truth. And I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say...